HP Hollow and Jacob Hollow here with you again to celebrate the upcoming release of the third book in the Monster Punk Horizon series, Monster Punk Horizon Excess, which is written by the two of us. And today we're going to give you a little glimpse um, into the book itself. We're going to read uh, from the first chapter. Yep. And since the two of us wrote it together, we are going to read it together as well. And so I think Jacob is going to kick off the first half of the chapter, chap, chip, 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 chapter, <laughs> which he wrote. And then I actually went we're, we're, in We're good and, at writing words. We're not really good at saying words I can't, sometimes. I can't do the words with my mouth very well that often. <laughs> but, but anyway, so he's going to read the first part. I'm going to read the second part. And hopefully you will enjoy the entire thing. So let me find... Where's, where's it start? Okay. There you go, Jacob. Have fun. I'm going to have coffee. Okay. Chapter 1. Broken Spell Glass. Why would anything need this many teeth? Pix muttered to herself as she studied the sketches and diagrams laid out on the long wooden table before her. A gust of wind from the ocean fluttered her tense tarp, but her mind focused on the creature's silhouette, sketched roughly in black ink on a much abused and much observed piece of paper. So many teeth. Was this really a good idea? Documents and equipment cluttered every inch of the table's surface. Detailed maps of the jungle surrounding Skull Harbor, vague reports of mysterious monster sightings, researcher notes on changes in the indigenous monster's behavior, and the disassembled pieces of her capacitor blade. Her weapon of choice took up plenty of room, but not because it was big. It wasn't especially large, at least not when fully assembled, but it was a complex weapon a long, double-edged blade bisected by a milky spellglass rod, with a hilt comprised of both mechanical and mysteric parts. These interlocked to allow the blade to open and the magic contained within its revolving cylinder to fire. She laid out every piece on an unfurled roll of, of canvas, carefully and meticulously cleaned each one, and set them down in a neat orthogonal manner. She'd scrubbed and oiled them until the gears rods and springs glowed in the lantern light, then sharpened both halves of the blade to a supremely lethal edge. Every mechanical component was as good, if not better, than when she'd commissioned the weapon, but there was nothing she could do for the spell, spell glass. I'm just doing stuff in the background. All right. <laughs> you just want to sit here. <laughs> I don't know about its teeth, Miss Pix, a bright, youthful voice said from her side. Would you like me to check my Graham's book? Maybe she'll have written something down from her adventures. Pix grimaced and glanced down at her Catian's assistant. Nova's wide, soulful eyes glistened up at her, their vertical pupils eager for an opportunity to aid her contracted hunter. The young cat person stood only two feet tall, her fur a patchwork of black and white, most of it wrapped in a gleaming blue set of rentillion radiant centillion <laughs> armor crafted to look like a princess's dress which was inspired by my uh palico's mm -hmm. armor for a lot of uh, monster hunter world yep anyway she may have been short for her kind but her enthusiasm more than com compensated for her size nova pix said dolly yes miss pix nova's ears perked up and swiveled forward We've talked about this before, haven't we? I'm not sure, her ears drooped. What do you mean, Miss Pix? This Miss Pix thing. I've told you not to call me that. But... Nova clutched her grandmother's hunting journal to her chest and wiggled as if suddenly uncomfortable. But my gram caught me not using it and she said I was being disrespectful. I never meant to be disrespectful to you, Miss Pix. Ugh. Pix put a hand to her forehead. Please stop. Miss Pix sounds silly, and Pix isn't even my real name. It's just something Jazz started calling me back in college. Oh, okay. Nova took a took on a thoughtful look. Oh, should I call you Miss Weaver then? Pix narrowed her eyes and glowered down at Nova in a firm, nonverbal no. Maybe not. Nova hugged her book tighter. Suddenly, someone from outside flung the, 
tent flap open and barreled in with all the majesty and elegance of a drunken debutante who'd never worn high heels in her entire life but had decided there was no time like the present. What's up, minions? Speak of the devil, Pix muttered under her breath. Hello, Miss Jazz, Nova said brightly. Hey, Nova. Jazz plopped onto the corner of the table and crossed her arms and legs. Pix? Yes, Pix replied without looking up. You've been cooped up in here all weekend. I know. This time she did look up. Jazz and Pix may have been partners and roommates, but that didn't mean they were anything alike. Jazz wore her raven black mane in an unruly curling wave down to her shoulders, framing a dark complexion. Pix kept her blazing red hair neat and trim and out of her eyes during the frantic moments of a hunt, while her pasty, cream-colored skin refused to tan in the harbor sun. Her ears, too, were only subtly pointed due to her diluted, dilute ancestral dragon blood, whereas the more pronounced points of Jazz's ears attested to the rich dragon lineage of her family's bloodline. Most ancestral natives under the dazzling skies had elder dragon somewhere in their blood, but Pix and Jazz were on opposite ends of that genetic heritage. Their attire was equally disparate. Pix had traded her old mismatched tabard obscured leathers for a long gam gamison made from some of the Parajk. You're I'll, the one who. I'll say it. No, no. What I, is it? <laughs> You're the one who came up with some of these names. Is it Parajka or Parajka? Yeah, it's, it's Parajka. It? Okay. Parajka hides they'd carved last month. The thickness of the padded coat made it naturally good for fending off slashes and puncture attacks, which is how her intended target would deal most of its damage. But the tough, tightly interlocked scales covering its outermost surface provided an additional layer of defense. The frog-like piranha-toothed uh, parajkas might have been low-level monsters, but the way their scales compressed and tightened under direct thrusts meant armor made from their hides would be useful for many levels beyond its origins. For additional defense, she'd cover it, covered it in segments of Ignifex hide that granted a high degree of mobility and fire protection, very useful in the Ignifex-dominated regions near Skull Harbor. By contrast, Jazz's figure strained against her monster skin, hot pants, and bikini <laughs> top, leaving little to the imagination. <laughs> Those two pieces of clothing may have also been crafted from Ignifex hide, but they only serve to make her butt and boobs fireproof. <laughs> it's useful. It's practical in that setting. That is so something Jazz would have said. Yep. <clears throat> Not that this advantage mattered to her. Jazz had only chosen the material because she had a lot of it, and red was her color. You should come join us at the canteen. Jazz patted her on the arm. It's waffle day. Sorry, Pix continued, but I still have a ton of work to do. But it's waffle day, Jazz spluttered, as if Pix had just said she didn't plan to observe Hallamas this year. Hallamas was a weird, quasi-religious holiday that had evolved over the centuries. No one remembered what its original purpose was, but everyone still celebrated it because it was one of those holidays when it was socially acceptable to eat exorbitant amounts of candy and rich holiday foods while romping around in sexy costumes and generally being ridiculous. Not that the hunters here needed a holiday to do so, but they weren't going to turn down the excuse. <laughs> That really encapsulates the hunters of the yep. of, of Skull I'm Harbor. Have there. To write a Hollowmas story now. You can just add it to your list of things. Yes. <clears throat> I don't understand everyone's obsession with waffles. Pix dismissed. They're just overcomplicated pancakes. When was a pancake ever considerate enough to hold extra toppings for you in convenient, specialized pockets? Jazz, Pix huffed. I'm trying to work. Yeah, about that. Jazz scooched closer and draped an arm over Pix's shoulders. You see, the thing about life, the really important thing about life, is you've got to live it. 
You can't live it when you hide in a tent all weekend looking at papers and stuff. Such inspirational words, Nova exclaimed. Thank you for sharing them. See, Nova appreciates my immense profundity. I am living. Pix took hold of Jazz's wrist and removed the unwanted arm from her shoulders. And I want to continue living. Why do you think I've been cooped up in here? Because you're a stick in the mud who doesn't like to have any fun? No, because of this. Pix held up the spell glass rod from her disassembled weapon. Hmm. Jazz squinted at the clouded rod, slightly darker at the end that connected to the hilt mechanisms. What do we have here? <clears throat> a crack in the base and mysteric degradation. Oh, Jazz uttered. All the joy and sass leaked from her face as the revelation sobered her up. A hunter's relationship with their weapon was a deeply personal one. It started with the initial selection and training, continued through the daily maintenance rituals and hard-earned upgrades, and sometimes ended in bloody, life-or-death moments in the field. A hunter's weapon was a dear, invaluable friend, a trusted, unflinching colleague through any trial the monstrous continent could throw at a hunter. At that hunter. <clears throat> and Pix had just told her... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and Pix had just told Jazz her friend was dying. Aww. Yeah. Oh, Pix frowned. I'm guessing it's got two, maybe three shots left before the rod burns out. Well, I suppose we haven't been kind to our equipment recently, what with the screecher and all the other dung we've, been ha we've had to deal with these past few months. I know, and that's probably why it's in such bad shape right now. Can you replace the rod? Can't afford it. I'm still paying off loans for this one. Damn, yeah, that sucks. I'd help you out, but... Jazz made an emptying pockets gesture, which would have been more appropriate if she'd actually had pockets. I know, Pix said, and I wouldn't ask for a favor like that even if you could. I appreciate the thought, though. So, what are you going to do about it? Jazz asked. Miss Pix has a plan! Nova inserted brightly. Of course she does. Jazz agreed, unsurprised. Pix could be relied upon for many things, and one of them was to always have a plan. This reminds me of our monster hunting uh, exploits in Monster Hunter World. And... There's a reason for that. Yeah. <laughs> now what's this super awesome plan you've been working on? It's still a work in progress, Pix stressed cautiously. Well, clearly, Jazz picked up a random piece of paper from the table. What's this? My shopping list. You don't say. Jazz cleared her throat and then began to read. Six ex 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 zesion. Pick's correct. That's not a Z, Jazz exclaimed. That's how it's pronounced, Pick's replied. Fine. Jazz shrugged, then continued. Six Zessian spinal gems, black, large. Twelve Zessian teeth, mouth. She looked up from the sheet. Did you really need to specify that last bit? You'd be surprised. Seems a little redundant to me. Two Zessian claws, front leg. Two Zessian claws, back legs. Ten square feet of hide, back or top of head. Three Zessian teeth, tail. Jazz set the sheet down. Tail teeth. Yeah, tail teeth, Pix replied. So, you're looking to hunt a Zessian. That's right. Quite a grocery list you've got there. The gems are the most important items. I can't afford a new rod, but I can hunt for the parts I need to commission a replacement, which will be much cheaper. Sounds like a great plan so far. Well, there are a few hang-ups. The biggest problem is... Only certain types of gems can be melted down and formed into spell glass, and the monsters native to the harbor aren't exactly replete with this trait, which is why you need to go after a Zessian. Precisely. A Zessian, you say? Good old Zessians. Jazz nodded knowingly, her face serious. Yes, that'll be quite a challenge. You don't have an idea what a Zessian is, do you? Pick said. I... Jazz shrugged. 
Yeah, you got me. <laughs> That's not surprising. Pix replied. Hey! <laughs> Jazz objected. No, I mean, because it's not in the Hunter's Handbook yet. The Society for the Exploration of the Monstrous Continent had known about the Zestian for some time, but researchers had to gather a certain threshold of information about it before it would receive an official entry in the Encyclopedia of Known Monsters. And the Society was picky about the quality of information that was released in its publications. There was, a, there was lots of peer review involved, which meant there had to be lots of hunts to gather information in the first place. And people generally didn't hunt Zessians until they had a specific reason to. There's a decent amount of research in the Society Library, though. Pix continued, gesturing across the table to indicate the notes she'd spread there. She then grabbed one particular page and smoothed it out so Jazz could see it. The drawing that dominated the page was marked in Pix's real initials, TW, for Taylor Weaver. And though she was still developing as a naturalist, naturalistic artist, she'd managed to capture the pants-wetting, terror-inducing presence of the beast. It wasn't incredibly detailed, just a big black silhouette, long, muscular, and low to the ground. But it had teeth. Lots and lots of teeth. Yikes. Jazz cringed. Yeah, Pix said, not bothering to look. That's how most people react. You want to hunt that thing? That I do. You sure this is a good idea? Nope. Wait a second. Jazz's face scrunched up in confusion. How'd something this mean manage to roam around without me hearing about it? Because Zessians aren't native to the harbor, Miss Pix. Nova chimed. After they fell from the dazzling skies, they nested in the hell pits and stayed there. They seemed to like it hot. Oh, we're going to the hell pits? Jazz beamed. You know, we're gonna have to visit the Demon Fae when we go. They're drama queens, but they throw the best. We're not going to the hell pits. Pix responded. They'd been to that harsh volcanic region once before when they'd gotten overconfident in their early hunting skills, and they'd only survived because a passing party of demon fey hunters recognized Jazz from the Team Red fan magazines that occasionally made their way from the, from the wondrous continent. It turned out the demon fey were rabid fans of the monster-battling tournaments back home, especially the one ones fought by Team Red. And given that Jazz's full name was Jaspertina Red, they joined the in the hunt purely for the novelty of helping out a very minor celebrity. Jazz didn't have the skills, or desire, necessary to be a professional monster trainer back on the mainland, but there was still some small fame to be garnered from being one of the daughters of Spinella Red. In fact, Jazz and Pix now had a standing invitation to come to the Hell Pits whenever they pleased, but it wasn't something they'd ever, ta ever taken the Demon Fae up on. I want to go to the Hell Pits one day, Nova said wistfully, and the tone of her voice was so ill-matched to the danger of that fiery wasteland that Pix had to ask, why? Oh, I forgot about this part. <laughs> yeah, this, this is the part you had. Oh, yeah, this is the well, part. Well, a lot of this you added, as, as you were kind of amping up the scene yeah. with, with lore mm -hmm. that hadn't been there when I was... Initially writing it. I do like my lore dumps. Anyway. <clears throat> my oldest brother and sister say they have lots of rare monster cards there. I want to go see them in person. Oh, Pix remarked. That makes more sense. The Demon Fae were also rabid collectors. And that included the Monster Punk Arena trading card game imported from the Wondrous Continent. Demon Fae merchants made special voyages from their shores solely to bring the game's updates to the monstrous continent. In fact, much of the drama that occurred in the Hell Pits coincided with the releases of newest expansion packs and limited edition collector's cases. And while it mostly stayed in the Hell Pits, word of the 25th anniversary special promo war had <laughs> reached as far as skull harbor wonder what hobby i was getting into when i wrote this yeah i have no idea <laughs> still a bit dangerous for someone of your skill level though pick stated oh i know nova beamed that's one of the reasons why i want to be a good catting it 
Oscar and Ariel said they they'll take me to a release when they think I can hold my own in a crowd fight. Wait, Pick said. So, part of the reason why you're hunting real monsters is to train yourself to fight so you can survive crowds battling to buy monster cards. Mm-hmm, Nova said, as if this was reasonable. Makes sense to me, Jazz added. If you can beat up a monster, you can definitely beat up another nerd. <laughs> Pix couldn't even find the motivation to roll her eyes at that. Or rather, she could. But she also knew it would be such a dramatic role that she'd probably pull one of her vital eye muscles and then be at a disadvantage in the next hunt. So, with great effort, she abstained. Well, I'm glad I can help you achieve your goal. Pix patted the long fluffy wig on Nova's head, and Nova beamed back, happy to help and be helped by Pix. Anyway, she continued, then indicated some of the field reports on the table. You know how the Ignifex population hasn't been causing as much trouble recently? I... Jazz blinked. Yes? Just take my word for it, Pix sighed. The number of Ignifex assignments being posted is down. Way down. Like, over 50% down. Oh, which means something else could be hunting them. Right. There are a few other indicators, such as reports of unusual inju injuries on some of the monsters or atypical movement patterns. But the bottom line is I think a Zessian has migrated to Skull Harbor. A wandering Zessian, if you will. And that monster is subsisting on a diet of Ignifex meat. Ignifexes have it rough in the series. Yeah, they do. I need to just write a book where the Ignifexes just have a good day with ice cream or something. Well, you know. The boss Ignifexes. <laughs> the boss Ignifex has a good day, but anyway. I mean the species as a whole. Anyway. anyway. Sounds good. Apparently, he likes his food spicy. He. You sure it's a male? Probably, Pick said. I haven't found any reports of female Zessians straying too far from the pack tyrant. But I suppose there's a first for everything. I'm guessing competition between the males forced this one to migrate. And then it settled down once it found the Ignifex buffet. Exactly. You could be right. Jazz nodded, then stood up. So, when do we leave? Don't you have waffles to eat? Pfft, those can wait. My friend needs some new gems. Thanks, Jazz. Pick smiled warmly. I appreciate that. Don't mention it. Jazz gestured to the map. So where do we start? Simple. Pix's eyes twinkled. Follow the buffet. End of scene. Oh, is it my turn now? Yes. Oh, Gimme. All right. Let's see here. Let me see how much. All right. All right. Now it's my turn. Of course, right after she said it, a tremendous rumble ripped through her stomach and startled some passing hunters into snatching for their weapons. She waved them off when they bounded into the tent her face reddening, and now that she thought of it, she hadn't eaten breakfast. She'd been so eager to get to work on her blade that she'd completely forgotten. You know, maybe I should stop for a bit, she said, and began to clean up her spot. Nova helped sort her papers as she reassembled her capacitor blade, and soon she, Jazz, and the little catient were riding, up, were riding the chain lifts up to the canteen. There was such a commotion there that Pix thought there might have been news of a new monster, but really that was just the reality of Waffle Day. An active crowd of hunters bustled and shouted around the central cooktop, elbowing each other for access and occasionally cheering when the old catient at the center did something particularly interesting on her stove. The catient cook Darla was an immovable fixture of Skull Harbor. Once a hunter herself, she'd retired decades ago to pursue a passion for cooking that rendered her the honorary grandma of everyone in the harbor. She greeted everyone with a sweet demeanor and a fluffy body made for hugs. But though she'd since passed her hunting gear onto her grandbaby, Nova, she still had something of the ferocious, ferocious hunter in her. Last month, Pix had seen her almost single-handedly take down a brand new monster in defense of her canteen, and though she didn't mind being on the end of Darla's hugs, she never wanted to be on the end of Darla's ladle. Not when it was hefty enough to be a weapon, and especially not, when, not since she'd specked it out with magical gems. Good morning, babies. Darla waved to Pix and company through the crowd. 
She was the sort to greet everyone who stepped into her eatery, no matter how busy she was. Good morning, Graham, Nova replied, and then sprinted around the throng toward their party's usual table. Pix and Jazz braced themselves and skirted around the melee, for it was a melee. The most exuberant culinary melee they'd seen outside of actual cooking competitions. Okay, true fact, this is actually based on Waffle Day at my college. It was nuts. <laughs> Every Friday was Waffle Day, and we were girls, a bunch of girls, and we partook. <laughs> Darla had harnessed the collective manic energy of the Harbor Crafters to create a series of custom waffle irons that pressed extra deep pockets into the sweet, crisp carbohydrate goodness the better to hold extra syrup or whatever else the hunters chose to fill them with. While her kitchen assistants kept the batter flagons stopped so hunters could press their own waffles, Darla stayed at her griddle whipping up various types of cockerel eggs, crispy bellow boar bacon and breakfast ham, and a variety of other proteins to balance the sweets, for the hunters who actually wanted to eat intelligently for the day's hunt. Most of them, though, had filled their waffle pockets with any variety of sweet syrups and whipped creams, and Pix was under the impression that any fruits or berries that happened onto their waffles were accidents. The one person who topped his waffle like a reasonable being was seated at their customary table with a costume skull mask clipped to one side of his goggles, which were focused on a hunter's handbook like he was studying for an exam. Kaito had fallen from the sky a little over a month ago in the midst of what he'd called a wyvern con, and in that time he'd quickly gone from bewildered newcomer to a careful adept hunter determined to make it back through the sky portals. Granted, no one had ever actually succeeded in going back through the portals, but that didn't stop him from trying to figure out why and how he could harness the resources of this land to defy them. Plus, he was a purebred human. According to local lore, pure humans were imbued with a near-magical amount of luck. And while Pix and Kaito himself questioned the veracity of that belief, they couldn't deny that the lucky coincidence of his falling with a specific weirdly tasty candy in his pocket had been the thing that saved Skull Harbor from certain disaster last month. The past two months had been plagued by a colossal eldritch monster they dubbed the Screecher. It had taken the combined efforts of every Skull Harbor hunter and even a few monsters to beat it back the first time, only for it to re-emerge a month later in a different, even more heavily armored form. They'd nearly lost Skull Harbor itself that time, but managed to stop it again through a whole lot of targeted gathering, mostly of galvanic gems, and one particularly lucky miracle on Kaito's part. The reason why he was lucky laid on the table in front of his book, next to a little bowl of sugar bacon candies that Darla had whipped up after Kaito showed her the tin. Dragon Pig was half pig and also half dragon, with the leathery red wings and fiery breath and temper to show for it. Despite being half pig, he also had an affinity for bacon and bacon-flavored things, and it had been a lucky combination of impatient rage and Kaito's well-timed bacon candy bribe that had unleashed Dragon Pig's next level form. Truthfully, Dragon Hog had been the essential being that turned the tide against the Leviathan creature and its brood, but he wouldn't have been awakened without Kaito's use yeah, Kaito's fateful candy, without his luck. Presently, though, Dragon Pig was content to be in his cute little kickball sized form, snoring and occasionally flicking an articulate tongue out to sleep grab a candy from the bowl. He'd been sleeping a lot since that day, and Pix couldn't figure out whether it was because he was recharging from that massive expenditure of magic, or if he just did it because he could. Either way, he hadn't done anything particularly exciting since that day, which Kaito said was perfectly fine by him. Pix found Kaito a refreshing presence. He was thoughtful and methodical in everything he did, right down to his food, which was presently a waffle topped with a modest drizzle of syrup and a pile of ruby berries that he dipped into a reasonably sized dollop of whipped cream like he was eating at some fancy restaurant, except when Dragon Pig reached his tongue out to take one. Then Kaito gave it to him. Jazz plopped her butt on the table next to him and scratched Dragon Pig's head. You're not taking full advantage of all the possibilities of that waffle, she said. There's barely enough cream there to fill one pocket. I don't want to barf on today's hunt, Kaito replied sensibly. I made that mistake on the last waffle day. My body's still getting used to the food here. Back home, we mostly had manufactured nutrient pastes. That just means you've got to condition it more. I don't think it's a matter of conditioning, Jazz, Pix said. It's a matter of no healthy being should eat that much sugar. I eat that much sugar. Yeah, but you have a strong elder dragon bloodline. Maybe that's a perk. I certainly can't eat like you do. 
Well, Jazz rose from the table. I'm about to go make ample use of my bloodline. <laughs> we should leave our weapons here, Pix said. That'll make it easier to navigate the crowd. Ugh, Jazz groaned, loath to part from her beloved great sword for even a little bit, but also willing to sacrifice when it came to waffles, because that was how her priorities worked. She slipped the weapon off her back, laid it upon the tabletop with an absurd amount of delicacy for an item she, she literally used to beat on monsters, and then sprinted into the hungry throng. You be careful, Nova, Pix said as she removed her own weapon. That crowd's pretty feisty. I will, Miss Pix. If I can't handle Waffle Day crowds, then I'm not worthy of monster card crowds, Nova replied, and shot off into the horde with a speed and direction that looked surprisingly born of strategy. Well, Pix thought, whatever motivation works, and then laid her weapon beside Jazz's and followed. Now that her stomach had reminded her how empty it was, Pix fully understood the enthusiasm surrounding Darla's cooktop. The air swirled around them, rich with the scents of butter, sugar, and sizzling monster fat. The waffle lines passed quickly. Darla had set up plenty of stations, and soon Pix and Jazz came to the front. In addition to setting up self-serve stations, Darla had seen fit to commission waffle irons of various sizes to suit different appetites. After all, a huge variety of races and species bustled under the dazzling skies, each with their own different dietary requirements. Not that the hunters ever used them as intended. Jazz went straight for an iron the size of a small buckler shield, intended for orc kind and other generally huge and active hunters. Pix, meanwhile, meant for the more reasonably sized mini iron, which was about the diameter of her hand and meant for fey kind and other races that didn't necessarily need traditional nourishment, but enjoyed it all the same. The red Ignifex gem set in the iron's cover had gone dull, so she grabbed a pre-faceted gem from the bowl next to the iron and replaced it. The canteen went through lots of Ignifex gems on Waffle Day. One of Darla's catient assistants brought her a freshly blended container of batter, and she poured a modest amount onto the grid of the iron before reclosing it and listening to the pleasant hiss of steam as the fire magic of the gem cooked the batter to perfection. The gem flashed when it was done. Pix wondered at the clever faceting that must have been required to make the gem do that. She'd never seen a gem follow directions before, nor do anything more complicated than glow or unleash magic from an external stimulus. But then she wouldn't have been surprised to learn that one of the frat men had invented it solely for Waffle Day. They were a party of lapidaries, after all, and their enthusiasm for absurd collegiate dorm gem-cutting experiments had followed them all the way over from Mysteric University. Her waffle finished, she lifted the lid and eased it onto a small plate from a nearby stack, then forewent the topping line to request some bacon and eggs from Darla's ever-sizzling cooktop. She wasn't about to hunt for a Zessian in the midst of a syrupy food coma, and bacon and eggs had nourished her well on previous hunts. Soon she left with two slabs of perfect crispy bellow boar bacon and an over-easy cockerock egg twice the size of her waffle, with plenty of savory yolk to complement the sweetness of the waffle. There was just something about cockerock yolk that made it work well as a topping, or sauce, and she didn't like the overwhelming richness of syrup anyway. This was her perfect, balanced waffle day meal, just sweet enough to be novel, but nourishing enough to fuel her day. She returned to the table. Noble was already there, eating a smartly balanced plate of eggs, bacon, and some ambiguous meat Darla had pressed into monster-shaped nuggets, and Jazz plopped her plate down soon after. Jazz had not balanced her meal. She'd used her waffle like a plate at a family reunion and loaded it with the most decadent toppings Darla had offered, a pile of sweet, fresh ruby berries and azure berries, a pad of butter that looked like it had been served from an ice cream scoop, a dollop of whipped cream the size of her head. Oh, do we have a visitor? Oh, we do. It's Nova. Hold it. We got to pause, you guys, because Nova has to say, hey. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's Nova. She's in a cone of shame because she had an ear removed. But otherwise, she is okay and recovering nicely. So, you want to hold the baby? Sure. There you go. She'll probably try to walk everywhere. Okay. Can All we right. tell, tell them very briefly? The what? short version of why Nova now looks extra badass is because she had a little spot of cancer on one of her ears. And the vet had to amputate it to make sure that it didn't spread. And we just heard back from the vet. And it hasn't spread. So, Nova is now cancer-free and super fierce looking. So, and she's purring so loud. Okay, can I continue reading, miss? Okay, Nova's down here giving me permission, I think. I don't need, what's she doing? She wants scratches. Okay, she wants scratches. Okay, the boss cat is getting her scratches, and I'm going to continue reading. I don't know where my place was. Oh, okay. 
a dollop of whipped cream the size of her head, and an obnoxious glob of hot chocolate fudge. No syrup? Pix asked with a raised eyebrow. No, I thought syrup would have been overdoing it, Jazz replied, and then took a serving-sized spoon to the whipped cream to start unearthing her actual waffle. Pix sighed at her excess, ah, given the inevitable challenge of the day's hunt. But then, now that she thought of it, Jazz never seemed to have bad reactions to eating too much. So where are Hattie and Tree? Pix asked as she cut a small square from her waffle. It's not like them to skip waffle day. It came and went already, Kaito replied. Apparently some good loot fell from the sky before dawn and they were one of the few teams awake for it, so they got a decent haul. What kind of good loot? Pix asked. Usually they show us first. Oh, not good like useful, Kaito clarified. Good like dumb things collectors put up lots of gems for. Hey, I like dumb things, Jazz objected. But you're not willing to pay perfect grade gems for the dumb things. Or able, Pix added. Fair enough, Jazz replied. At least the dragon pig pirates will eat super well this week, though. I got cat hair in my book. Nova. He's leaving bits of Nova glitter everywhere. As she does. Dragon Pig Pirates was the name the party collectively applied to themselves, not because they were actual pirates, but because it sounded neat and Dragon Pig was mascot level cute. Hattie and Tree occasionally joined Pix, Jazz, and Kaito on hunts, but their real occupations were as wyvern riders, whose main activity consisted of catching interesting junk when it fell from the portals, or interesting people, as when they'd caught Kaito. They usually ended up spending some of their earnings on the whole party, though, because Tree was, well, a tree, and had all the simple physical needs of a tree, and Hottie just liked to have people to hang out with. What are you working on? Jazz continued, peering over Kaito's shoulder. Brushing up on some unfamiliar monsters, Kaito replied. I heard some talk about a caustic to javelin and figured it sounded like something I should know about. Yeah, that's a nasty one, Pix replied. She and Jazz, and really the whole of Skull Harbor, had had a run-in with a caustic de javelin during the first creature hunt two months ago. The basic de javelin was nasty enough. Its name, among other things, came from the one massive horn that sprouted from its forehead, which it would thrust toward its opponents as if its whole body was a javelin. Beyond that, it was the apex species of the Skull Harbor jungle, a big, angry monster covered in ragged horns with an attitude that liked to use them at the smallest provocation. The caustic variant was that and capable of spewing clouds of caustic smoke that could virtually melt any creature caught in its path. Through an absurd string of chances, she and Jazz had ended up riding one bareback and survived. But still, it was not a creature Pix wanted to encounter again. How's your earworm report coming, by the way? Kaito asked of Jazz. I turned in a short version last week just to get the chief researcher off my back, Jazz replied, polishing off the last of her whipped cream, then spreading the half-melted scoop of butter over the berries. Thing is, I don't have enough data for a proper report at the moment. I mean, when I started putting earworms in monsters' ears, it was on a whim while I was hunting, not with any actual research intent. But now that the Society is interested, I think I'm going to sit down and design a proper research project. I was looking at what the Society offers for full-scale projects, and if it gets accepted, they'll grant me extra resources to pursue it. That could be a way to get some better gear. Pix rolled her eyes, as if you're not just going to use the same old bikini armor and greatsword to do your research. Well, it's what I'm used to, Jazz replied. I was thinking more in terms of getting you better stuff. I mean, you'd be helping me, right? Pix nearly bristled at the assumption that she just helped Jazz on a major project without being asked first, but then realized that was kind of already what she did. And of course, though she enjoyed the challenge of earning her own stuff, she couldn't help but appreciate that Jazz wanted to use the project to help her. And then she realized something. Wait, are you actually serious about doing this? Why wouldn't I be? Because you've never been serious about anything. It's not that I'm not serious, Jazz said through a mouthful of buttery berries. It's that I'm only serious about things that catch my attention. I'm not going to waste effort on stuff I don't care about. And as I was writing my report, I realized this is actually kind of neat. There's no kinda about it, Jazz, Kaito said. You've discovered a way to communicate directly with monsters. Certain ones, anyway. And it's played instrumental roles in both Screecher battles. I've barely been here a month, and even I can tell that has the potential to revolutionize how we deal with monsters. You've already found at least two that can be reasoned with. I guess I did, huh? Jazz beamed, as if the full implications had only just occurred to her, and she decided to respond by being smug about it. Kaiko. As Jazz does. <laughs> I lost my place again. Oh. Kaito looked up from his work for the first time since the conversation started and squinted through his glasses at her, perplexed. Jazz, are you actually intelligent and pretending to be an idiot, or is it the other way around? I've been trying to figure it out since I got here, and I can't tell. I have so much intelligence, Jazz replied, unoffended. 
I also have so much energy and hyperactivity, and frankly, the latter wins out most days. She's not wrong, Pick sighed. Back at university, she aced all the classes she was excited about. Everything else got the bare minimum of effort. The day I figured out I could become an expert on one piece of reading and completely ignore the others was life-changing, Jazz said. Seriously, just talk a lot at the beginning of class discussion, in detail, on that one piece, and the professor will expect nothing else of you for the rest of the period. For real, that's how I got through some of grad school. <laughs> Nova's eyes lit up brightly when she heard that. Really? She said through a mouthful of nugget. Don't listen to her, Pix said. If you're in school, you should be there to learn, not to coast. I didn't coast, Jazz objected. I was efficient. Pix plopped her forehead down onto her palm. Why is it that you're only efficient when the reasons are stupid? There's no such thing as stupid efficiency. The more efficient you are with boring work, the faster you can get to fun work. And I don't want to be efficient with fun work because it's fun. I suppose that does make sense in a twisted jazz sort of way, Kaito replied. Jazz beamed again, then finally started on her waffle, now a soggy, decadent mess of melted butter, dissolved whipped cream, and the last few traces of chocolate. Dragon Pig flicked his tongue out for a piece, and she obliged. Well, we've got to do this zesty and hunt before I can sit down to pl- or- yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we've got to do this zesty and hunt before I can sit down to plan it, she said, and then horked down the rest of her waffle with a speed that was impressive for her human bloodline and probably even impressive for her dragon line. Shall we go? And Florence, little scene break. Yeah, last oh. scene. Huh? Are we done? No, we're not done. We've got like five more pages. It's a long chapter. Okay. It's a good chapter. We're going to finish it for our readers because we okay. love them. Okay. I thought we were doing two scenes. No, we're doing the full chapter. All right, I'll just be here and I will continue Hold. to massage uh, Nova. Nova. Yeah. Hold her up so everyone can see her well, again. Well, why don't we, oh, if you would, just angle the uh, Nova will camera. Say, Nova will say bye as we leave. Okay. Okay. Don't show them my floor. It's messy. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I didn't... Our... <laughs> You don't care about the floor when I'm here. Oh, you live here. You know how big a mess I am. The readers don't. Okay. Pix was mostly ready to go, but she'd had one more task to complete before her stomach had so forcefully interrupted her, so she decided to, to set to that first. Jazz and Nova traipsed off to do their own preparations, while Pix made her way to a small pavilion next to the gate that led out to the southern jungle. She set her capacitor blade on a communal workbench underneath its shade. Tenders... Uh, Hunters tended to use this pavilion for last-minute preparations before they went out into the jungle, so the table was covered with oil, grease, and nicks. But a cloth blade from her portable tune-up kit covered that problem. She placed her capacitor blade onto the cloth, and then she reached into one of her pockets. Her questing fingers found a small stone, and she grasped it tightly as she let out a long, mournful sigh. First the spell glass rod, and now this. At least it had been cheap. She took the dull yellowish gem out of her pocket and set it next to her blade's hilt, then unlatched the mechanisms that held the blade's revolving cylinder in place and sized the gem up next to it. Standard capacitor cylinders were made to hold cartridges of what the hunters called glitter, the ground-up powder of magical gems too small or flawed to merit being cut by a lapidary. Most capacitor blade hunters used glitter because it was cheap and plentiful, but the cylinders could easily be modified to accommodate full gems if they found a gem worth setting. Under normal circumstances, this would not be a gem worth setting. She'd had Kilvester, one of the frat men lapidaries, appraise it, and he'd said it had ten, maybe twelve good shots in it. This was roughly close to the amount of glitter she kept equipped at one time, six in the revolving cylinder, six spares, on her bandolier. But she couldn't afford that many cartridges, and her damaged spell glass had, would never survive so many shots anyway. So, in this one case, the gem was a cheap, suitable replacement for her normal loadout. The gem fit easily into the confines of the cylinder once two of the six standard, standard cartridge housings were removed, but the cut was so bad that the gem's housing would need adjustment. She frowned, opened her field toolkit, and retrieved a small screwdriver. The adjustments didn't take long, and after a few minutes the gem was snug and secure in the cylinder's frame, so she slapped the newly completed cylinder back into the blade, switched its locking mechanism back into place, and cycled the cylinder th to the gem's cartridge and pulled the trigger to split the blade open. Weak, mysteric energy crackled and climbed up the central rod. She closed the blade, thus stopping the flow of energy. Well, I guess that'll have to do, she sighed to herself. If it failed, at least, she could still hack the Zessie into pieces. 
She removed the cartridge, put her tools away, and checked around to see if Nova, Jazz, and Jazz's own caffeine had arrived. They hadn't, so she leaned against the workbench and waited. A cool morning breeze blew across her cheeks. Oh, what's she doing? <laughs> There's like a rain of cat hair floating in front of us. Oh my gosh. Okay. These, these pants are going straight into the wash. <laughs> a cool morning bl- breeze blew across her cheeks. And she found herself Still gazing. Floating. <laughs> <laughs> going up my nose. <laughs> we apologize. We are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> Thousands of portals to other worlds twinkled above like overachieving stars stretching from one horizon to the next. The dazzling skies had dropped and continued to drop unusual objects and creatures upon the monstrous continent and Pix's mind wondered for the moment what it all meant. The portals were not a natural occurrence. How could they have been? The people under the skies had developed a number of ways to explain them, some more valid than others. Still, even the most commonly accepted one was quite fanciful, that their world was merely entertainment for some eldritch, unfathomable being that dropped new items and creatures through the portals whenever it got bored. An increasingly popular explanation was that a hyper-advanced society had tried to bend time and space to their will and instead broke it, but that was mainly accepted just because it sounded neat and because their friend Hati had claimed to be from that society and witnessed it, which was as close as they came to evidence, even if Hati was a known embellisher of the truth. That's putting it lightly. (laughs) Even if- oh, I found a typo. Crap. Hold it. Okay, I'll just keep it in my brain. No, I won't, but anyway. I'll have, I'll have this video to remind me that it's here. Uh, even if that was the case, though, why did the portals remain so long after that disaster? Why did they pluck random things and people unceremoniously from their homes only to plummet, flailing and screaming, toward certain crunchy death below? The earliest Skyborns had been lucky that the Elder Dragons had fallen through first and been courteous enough to swoop in and save them. Their descendants had been lucky that the dragons were not hungry, but insatiably insatiably curious, enough to take on alternate forms to better understand these new strange arrivals. And the future was perhaps lucky that some had fallen in love and gotten busy. (laughs) Pix touched the pointed tip of one ear without thinking about it. Dragon blood was so pervasive, she couldn't even picture what a world without dragon kind would look like, even if the lineage was sometimes weak and deluded like hers. That last piece seemed irrefutable even to her weak bloodline. It took someone like Kaito, a pure-blood human fresh from the skies, to not have any mixed blood in the family tree, and she wondered about him, too. The world he came from sounded advanced, like the one that had produced the portals, but when he fell through the portals, he lost access to every technological resource that had fallen with him. She didn't quite understand the depths of what he'd lost, but the way he spoke, it sounded like he'd once had little machines running through him that could augment his senses, speed up his brain, and give him access to nearly infinite information. That sort of thing happened with every piece of electronic technology that fell through the portals, and no one could figure out precisely why because no one could even approach the portals to research them. It wasn't that they couldn't reach them. It was that when they did reach them, they were overcome with some horrible inclination to turn back, lest they suffer some cosmic judgment. Oh, she's flicking her tail at me. Given these reactions, it was understandable that most everyone, even in the society, greeted talk of researching the portals with a how-about-not. But Pix was curious. Kaito's ultimate goal was to make it back through the portals, to go home. And Jazz was indiscriminately energetic enough that she'd just go along with it and tell the cosmic challenge to go F itself, or, more likely, to join her for an ale if that was interesting enough. But that was another adventure for another time. What you got there? A sudden voice interrupted her thoughts. Pix glanced to her side to see Jazz sauntering toward the pavilion, skimpy armor hugging her curves, great sword slung across her back, and a flagon of sugary frozen coffee from the society bookshop gripped in one hand, as if all the sugar from the morning's waffle wasn't enough. Pix was about to shrug and ask what Jazz was talking about, but then realized what she still held in her own hand. This? She waved the cartridge. Jazz nodded and stopped next to her. Why, this is a pitiful capacitor cartridge made from a lesser galvanil gem, and a horribly cut one at that. What you doing with it? Zessians are weak to galvanic energy. In fact, that's about the only element they're weak to, and this is the best I could afford. You don't have any better gems left over from that big haul we made last month, before the Screecher fight? What I didn't sell at market we used up in the fight, Pix replied. You didn't keep any? Jazz exclaimed. It was a life-or-death situation, Pix objected. I didn't want to hold any back in case we needed them. 
Oh. Jazz's brow furrowed and she crossed her arms. She took on an appearance of great internal discomfort. What's with that look? If you need to go, best do your business before we leave. <laughs> no, it's not that. Besides, if I need to go, I'll just go in the jungle. It's a jungle. Jazz, that'll make your scent easier for monsters to... Pix began, then sighed, remember who she, remembering who she was talking to. What is it, then? Hang on, I've got an idea. Jazz retrieved the massive plank of her greatsword and set it heavily on the workbench. This isn't going to be like that time you suggested we slather our bodies in peanut butter and run through the jungle shouting mating calls in an attempt to attract that shining cockerock. No, this is even better. That's not exactly a high bar you're aiming for, you know. Shush. She grabbed hold of something on her greatsword's fort, made some complicated unlatching noises, and then twisted. What are you doing? Pix asked. Hang on, I've almost got it loose. Got what loose? There. Jazz held the gem aloft triumphantly. The massive stellaric opal was easily the size of her face, and its depths danced even in the pavilion shadow with wild, iridescent brilliance. That's... Words caught in Pix's throat, and she swallowed. Here. Jazz offered her one of the most valuable gems in existence. A gem found only in the guts of rare stellaric titans. A gem so powerful it could adapt its element to any monster's weakness. Are you serious? I am. She nudged Pix's hand with the gem. Come on, take it. Jazz, you know I can't do that. That'll put a huge weak spot in your blade. Besides, that thing's so powerful it'll burn out this crappy rod in one shot, guaranteed. This blade's due for replacement anyway, Jazz replied. And best to go out with a bang, I say. Besides, one awesome shot has got to be better than two or three piddly ones. Jazz! Now don't misunderstand me. I'm lending it to you. For this one hunt only. Surely your pull-yourself-up-by-your-own-bootstraps code won't get in the way of that. It's not a code, you know. It's just the way I want to live my life. Whatever. Jazz nudged her with the gem again. Come on, take it. What are friends for? Pix hesitated, then swallowed again and nodded. She took the proffered opal and cradled it in both of her hands as if it were a delicate, newly-hatched chick. What are they for, indeed? Then she sniffled. Are you gonna cry? No, Pix protested and sniffled again. Come here. Jazz put her hands on Pix's shoulders. Let me give you a hug before you burst like a water main. Okay. Wait until the job's done before starting that sentimental dung, missies. A gruff voice suddenly belted into the pavilion. The women turned to spy two cats approaching from Monster Market. The first was Nova, now equipped with a backpack that, re that depicted the stylish monster punk arena version of a radiant centilion, followed by a catian that looked like a monster had chewed on him for a while before deciding that he was too damn tough and bitter to satisfy even a monster's culinary palate, and spat out the disgusting masticated wad. He had a backpack, too, but if it had ever re represented anything, it was lost in its years of adventuring wear and tear. I think it's sweet, Mr. Sasha, Nova said sternly to the other cat. Oh, sure, Sasha crowed, crossing his arms over his well-worn leather armor, right up to the point where it gets you killed in battle. Sentimentality's got no place where lives are on the line. It makes you unlucky. Pix had expected him to end the sentence with stupid. She couldn't deny, oh, did we get another? We got more cat hair flowing around here. Every time Nova shakes her little cone, it just sends cat hair everywhere. Okay. Pix had expected him to end the sentence with stupid. She couldn't deny that he'd made impulsive decisions on hunts, that, that she'd made impulsive decisions on hunts solely to keep Nova from being hurt. But in retrospect, unlucky made more sense for Sacha. He had a superstition that the more you told your teammates about yourself before going into battle, the more likely you were to die. And as a result, Pix and Jazz knew very little about him beyond what he'd told Jazz before she'd hired him. Pix questioned his reasoning. After all, she knew more than she ever wanted to know about Jazz, and they'd both lived through misadventures as ridiculous as accidentally bareback riding a caustic to Javelin. But then she couldn't deny that Sacha was one of the oldest catians she'd ever seen. Whatever he was doing to stay alive, he was doing it right. Y'all keep your feelings to yourselves, Sacha grumped. I'm here for work. We ready to leave? Almost, Pix said. I need some time to recustomize my cylinder. She hefted the Stellaric Opal. Otherwise, it'll be too big to fit in the slot. This thing will take up a lot more space than my current gem. And after you're done prepping the cylinder, Sacha asked. All three of them turned to Pix. First we pack up, she gazed at the nearby gate. After that, we follow the trail of corpses.
and that is chapter one. That's a long chapter, man. <laughs> All right. So again, well, you added a bunch to it. I know I did, but I didn't. I that's I guess writing a lot and describing a lot is just what I do. Anyway, so that is again chapter one of Monster Punk Horizon Book Three Excess, which is coming out Thursday, December twenty third. Kindle Unlimited, Kindle Store, Audio. However you want to experience it, it is available, or will be available. And so we hope you enjoy this book as much as we enjoyed writing it, and we look forward to seeing what you think about it. Also, say bye, Nova. Nova just wants to go nap in the trash some more. Nova likes to nap in the trash for some reason. All right, anyway, bye, everyone!